guppies to groupers. Tropical and marine fish in the home aquarium. Your host, Paul Spies. Now we've talked about a lot of fish around here in various times. Talked about uh, them in terms of their native habitat. Where that is, where do they originally come from? And for instance, we said the tetras come from South America and Africa. And we said the uh, cichlids come from South America and Africa, predominantly. And we said the barbs come from the Asian theater, Malay and Peninsula, that long in there, and Africa. And you notice the common ground is Africa. Has a little bit of everything, a real mixing bowl there. And if you're into the African scene, you can tell by looking at the mixture we got in a big tank here at the beginning. Today, we're going to talk about Africans, primarily African cichlids, a beautiful segment of the hobby, a reasonably new one, and one that has provided us with some brilliant fish, no question about that, fish that I almost match those uh, saltwater fish in terms of brilliance. The males do, and we'll see in one case here, a female that is exceptionally brilliant. But uh, like any cichlids, especially bigger ones, these uh, some of these guys here are seven, eight inches long, uh, they pose some problems, and we'll talk about those, keeping them, but they're cichlid problems. Now, uh, here's a beautiful one. This is a Haplochromus living stone eye, this mottled guy down at the bottom of the picture there, and another one of the same type coming into the picture there. Typical haplochromus, a rather long, slender body. Nice, bold markings on these. Uh, Cynodonus catfish just ducked out of the crack between the rocks. I'm sure he ducked out because some cichlid ducked in the other end, but that's the way it goes with the cichlids. You know, they all like to have their own cave, and uh, that's part of that problem I talked about keeping them. But you can see the fish swimming in and out of the picture. There are some, some brilliant colors in there. And despite, uh, here's another one. Now, this is another haplochromus. This is Euchylus. And you notice the lips on this guy? I would like you in particular, as we look at these different fish throughout the show tonight, to watch the mouths of these different fish. Because you're going to see every possible variation you can think of. And it says something about their feeding habits. And of course, you'll see a lot of aggressive tendencies like we just saw there. And you'll see some battered plants. But you see in the aquarium primarily rocks, woodwork, stuff like that. And again, nice mixture of fish. Excellent addition to the hobby. The African cichlid. Now that's a, a misnomer, if you will, African cichlid, because it, it doesn't say precisely what we're talking about. We're talking about the cichlids, when we say, well, I keep the Africans, or you hear somebody say, I've got African cichlids. They're not talking about any African cichlid. They're talking about the ones that come from the Great Lakes of Africa, as they're called. The ones along the eastern part of Africa. Now, here's the Indian Ocean out in here, the Atlantic over here, this part of Africa, over here. And we're talking about some very large lakes. This is Lake Victoria which is more than three times the size of New Jersey, but a relatively shallow lake. This is Lake Tanganyika, which is about 400 miles long. This is Lake Malawi, which is close to that, 365 miles long or so, but a mile deep. And these are the lakes that we talk about in Africa, the Great Lakes of Africa. So when people say they're keeping Africans or African cichlids, they're talking about fish from this area. They're not talking about, for instance, the Crebensis, which come from the other part of the world. They're not talking about the Egyptian mouth breeder. They're not even talking about the tilapia or the bigger free swimming uh, food type fish, if you will, that do inhabit some of these lakes. They're talking about fish like you saw in the beginning here and that we'll be looking at today. And some of the names that we find associated with these fish besides African cichlids, we'll see the name Rift Lake associated with them. Now, rift, of course, is just a depression. We're talking about a depression over there in Africa that's like the Grand Canyon, which has now filled in with water and has become lakes. And Victoria, that big one that was up at the top, is not a rift lake in the strict sense of the word. It's not in that area, but we tend to group them all together. 
people tend to call all of these Mbuna. Now, these two names are native names, but the Mbuna really is a name that is used for the uh, algae eating fish, the fish that uh, subsist largely on a diet of algae that grub on the rocks. And again, depending on the mouth type, you'll see fish eating straight in. You'll see fish eating like a catfish does, that type of thing. So these are algae eaters. The Utaka is another group, and that contains a lot of the haplochromis, like the ones we were looking at, at the, in the big tank at the beginning. So although a lot of people use these names indiscriminately, along with African cichlids, to mean any of these, there is a little bit of precision in some of these names. So I mentioned that for what it's worth, but basically fish from these lakes. And there are a lot of them, and we're showing just the bigger ones here. African cichlids. Well, with any cichlids, as we talked before, you've got to think nests. So you need good filtration. We keep after those tanks. You've got to feed them right. And we'll be talking a little bit about diet problems. You've got to take care of the cichlids if you want coloration like that and if you want to breed them. And we'll show you evidence of breeding here before we're over tonight. You've got a couple different kinds of breeders in this segment. We've got substrate breeders. That is ones that use a rock on the bottom or burrow to the nearest hard surface and lay their eggs on the bottom. For instance, like uh, these uh, bold striped guys in this tank up here. These uh, fish are substrate breeders and we're coming back to this a little later and we'll discuss this fish more. But they lay eggs on the bottom. Now, as opposed to that, many of them are mouth brooders. And after they fish form a depression in the sand or maybe burrow under a rock for a little uh, seclusion, they spawn. And in almost all cases, the female then picks up the eggs, incubates them in her mouth, in her throat. And one of the uh, female, oh, right out front, thank you. We have here one of the Labiotrophius fulborni, the mottled one you're looking at there. And that's a female, and you can see the throat on her is distended, way up near the front now. The, the floor of her mouth is stretched out because she's got a mouthful of babies that are about five or six days old. If they were two weeks old, we could take her out, open her mouth, and pop the babies out with no harm to either party. But it would be a little early now. All we'd see if we kicked them out right now would be a yolk sac and tail and eyes. So... The mouth brooders, as opposed to typical cichlid fashion spawning as we're used to it if you haven't been into the African scene yet. The fish vary considerably in mouth structure, and that's why I told you watch these fish in terms of the mouths as we go along. And that says a lot about their diet. And when we throw them all together in the tank, if we were to give them their preferred diet, we'd be putting in food, till, you know, we'd be there all day long. So we give them a mixture diet, uh, you know, standard brine shrimp, good dry food, that kind of thing. But as I said, cichlids, a lot of mess. Keep up with it if you want the best results. They have a variation in habitat, and that's a pretty good cross-section in that big tank as we look at it because some of the fish inhabit rocky areas, you know, a piece of wood, that kind of thing. Uh, some of them like a well-planted area. None of them like open water. And I recall distinctly yesterday when we were setting this up that all of those big Sagittarius plants there now that we were looking at, they were all down in one end of the tank. And all of those monster fish, and some of them are that long, they're all trying to get in those few plants. It's just natural. It's instinctive to stay out of the open. Why? Well, if you get out in the open too much, that's where somebody's going to grab you and eat you. That's the way that works at the bottom down there. The... Uh, there are a lot of predators in those lakes that eat cichlids. Now, in fact, in the beginning, we saw one of those cynodonus, one of those catfish, duck out from under one of the rocks or between a couple of rocks there. And I said, ah, he's running from another cichlid. Some of them get big enough. There's another cynodonus. You can see that bold spot on the side of them. That's the binotatus. Some of these get quite large. And this guy, which we think of as a nice catfish in our aquarium, is a predator on small cichlids. So are a number of other fish that we wouldn't normally think of as being uh, predators, if you will, especially on cichlids. We think of cichlids, hey, aggression, bold, mean, you know. We're talking about fish like uh, these spiny eels get very large, and they do a job on them, the electric catfish. 
Oh, the Clarius. All fish that we've looked at on the show are predators on the cichlids, as well as a lot of the African wildlife, if you will. So it's a tough life down there, and they stay out of the open water. Now, besides these considerations that we've talked about, there's an interesting problem of why don't these fish, which are all in this big bathtub together, why don't at least the fish in the same genus interbreed? They have found distinct colonies of Pseudotrophius this and Pseudotrophius that 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 are two, three hundred feet apart in the same lake and never interbreed. They will in the aquarium. We'll see that in a minute. Why? For two reasons. First of all, it's a natural preference kind of thing. Given a choice, a male will pair off with a female of its species. Denied that choice, he might look for a female of the same genus, different species. But that doesn't happen in the wild. The second thing is this abhorrence, this fear of open spaces that I talked about that is instinctive in all fish. It's part of their uh, survival technique. They are not going to swim in the open. So this colony of fish that uh, has taken over this pile of rocks or this clump of plants is not about to ever visit that guy down the road, although they're very close. For the simple reason, he's got to swim through that open water, and it's not going to happen. And that's a horizontal barrier, but the same thing happens in the up and down sense. You may have two colonies of fish, one living at, you know, 10 feet down and one at 30 feet down. They never mix for that reason. They're not about to leave the security. So a little bit about the African cichlids. Now, all of the fish you've been looking at here today were brought to Erie by a friend of mine from the Akron Aquarium Society fellow named Jim White, who's got to be some kind of fish nut. Hi, Paul. Jim, thank you for coming up. These are all Jim's fish, and I say uh, Jim is some kind of fish nut because you can't believe what I saw when he showed up with his van. Beginning, you brought all your own water, didn't you? Well, we brought most of the water, lots of fish, lots of garbage cans of <laughs> that's, tanks. That's what I saw, the garbage cans coming in, and they had the uh, uh, garbage bag liners in them and brought right. the water along. because pH is a little bit of a problem, isn't it? Yes, it is. On your Reflex, you want to keep a higher pH. What, in, uh, uh, 7, 5? 7, 4 to 7, 6, somewhere in there. And I wasn't quite there. sure what your water conditions was up here, so yeah. I figured that would haul on. That's the safe way, isn't it? And right. It lessens the shock when the fish have to make the transition from Jim's home to our aquariums here. Fortunately, we have good water here at the station. Uh, his wife points out that uh, there isn't enough oxygen in it, but uh, good water nevertheless. So, uh, as I say, everything you've looked at tonight and all the stuff we're going to look at is Jim's. He's brought it along, and it represents a, a small fortune in the way of fish. Jim, let's uh, get off of you and me. I think they'd rather look at fish. Okay. Uh, let's let's start, start with the table, huh? Let's start down here with some Tanganyikan fish, which are substrate spawners. This is the Ornatus, Julidochromus Ornatus. Brightly colored fish. The fry in front there. Mm -hmm. so we've, had, those, we've had spawns up runs anywhere from 20 to 40 fry per spawn. They're fairly easy to spawn. they not hard to pair off. I can't sex them, but... But they can sex each other. Right, they know. The guy doing a job on that snail, that's a big snail. What is that? That's a Columbian ram's horn or night and day snail. Uh, they call them night and day because one side's light and one side's dark. Let's take a look at that. I don't think we'll get that guy too worried. These cichlids don't seem to bother the snails in the tank. Uh, yeah. At our house, we keep a lot in there just to clean right. up the uneaten food because we it's feed quite heavy. Readily available, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Columbia night and day, night and day snail with a little chip in the edge of the shell here, Jim. Right. Put that right. on the bill. Okay. <laughs> the snails, uh, Paul, they spawn down in the water. Uh, it's different from like your mystery snails. People probably spawn mystery snails. They build up out of the water. Yeah. They lay yeah. their egg nest. These are down in the water and look like frog eggs. Oh, the jelly sack. The yeah. cichlids don't uh, bother the eggs either. Yeah, great. Okay, our second tank down here is another Julidochromus species. It's the Julidochromus transcriptus. Now, this is the hardest one that we have found to spawn. Mm -hmm. Some of my friends don't have any problem with it. We get spawns from anywhere from two to seven, they get 40 to 60. But we have trouble with it for some reason. Are these mature yet? Uh, yes, we've had one that's uh, our old females, three years old. 
Uh, that's the fry there you're seeing now, I believe. Uh, yeah, right there, there's, there's the, the fry. Picture, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're raising these. Right, but they're very slow coming. That's really the exciting part about the fish that Jim brought. He's brought babies of almost all of them along with him, so he is successful with the fish. This is the next one is another Julia de Cronus. There's uh -huh. three, there's four species of it. This is the third one. This is the Marlorine. It's the largest. And you've spawned all of these, huh? Yes, we've spawned all four species. Uh, the Marlorie is the largest of the Julia de Chroma species. I've seen them up around five to six inches in length. They're quite beautiful oh, fish. Oh, be at that Markings. Size. So distinctive markings. Uh, we're, they give it quite large spawns. We're getting 40 to 50 fry per mm -hmm. spawn on them every 30 days or so. Now the fry, you can leave in the tank with them and they'll just keep right on spawning. You'll have three or four different sizes in these Julies in the tank at the same time. Hmm. Pull the larger ones out and leave the smaller ones. Okay. The fourth species is the newer one. That's the Julie de Chromis regani. Um, they was a little hard to get to start with. Now they're getting around a little more. It's the most expensive right now. The price has got to come down. We got 196 fry in one <laughs> spawn. So they're quite prolific. So they're rather prolific. So that'll, right. that'll bring the price down. That's what does right. it, yeah. So, so four different raised. kinds of Julies. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. Another substrate spawner, which is quite large in comparison to the Julies, is a Lamprologus tetracanthus. Uh, they're quite pretty, quite mean. You don't want to keep them in a community tank. Uh, they give spawns of upwards of 200. Yeah. Uh, you can use my red towel if you want. See that? <laughs> yeah. There's a signal on her. I don't yeah. let everybody use the red towel. Okay. This guy's pretty aggressive, though. Yes, huh? he is. If you don't make room for him, he'll make room for himself. Oh, yeah. You put him in that big tank, and whatever didn't want to get out of his way would die shortly. <laughs> uh, he'll move him out. Yeah, we got the aggressive, but like a Dempsey, I guess. Yeah, we got some Bifernatus up here. They look like a Julie, but they're not. We've got some fry in the front, which are quite small. These are all adults. There's one male and three females in that tank. How old are the fry? The fry are right, right around 45 days old. Uh, I've read where they spawn at the age of 100 days, but for some reason, I can't get any size on them real quick. They get baby brine, flake food, anything they want, but they're fed think? five times a day, but they just don't want to grow for us. Haven't found a trick yet. This is a caninus. Ugly uh, guy. Yeah, there's not a whole lot of color to them, but they got unusual teeth. They're real jagged teeth. They look like a barracuda. <laughs> well, that's where the name the canines came from, the caninus. Probably. Sure. Uh huh. Yeah. Big set of teeth on them. Next tank over here, well, we've got some Lamprologus burchardi. Used to be named the Savarai. I keep calling them Savarai because I like that name. Yeah. Well, named after Pierre. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, he's done a lot of work in the hobby, and I guess he sh deserves to be honored. Sure does. Uh, this is a very pretty fish. Flowing fins. The yeah. fins is what's got it going Liar for this fish. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. The fry uh, are quite pretty, too. They you have a lot of trouble with a lot of cichlid fry, but you can usually get rid of these. You're not hung with too many of these around the house. Uh -huh. Move them out pretty good. Looks like another Julie here. Well, this is a, the coloration of these fish. This is the shallow Dichromus burchardi. Mm -hmm. uh, when they're smaller than this, they're polka dotted and they look like the uh, Marlari. As they get a little older, they lose these spots and they get the two stripes like the Ornatus. <laughs> a little older, older where they get looking like a Regani. And then in adulthood, why they don't look anything like they did when they was fry. Now, Jim brought a picture along here to show us the adult because he didn't want to move the parents and uh, you can see a completely different fish, so. These fish we found at our house are quite hard to get together, male and female. We've had a glass petition between them. We finally got them going. We got our first spawn of fry and I didn't want to yeah. move them. Yeah, well, I, I don't blame you, I don't blame you. But Brought a picture so everybody could see what it was like. But if you keep Africans, you end up with this, huh? You end up with a lot of uh, fry. You need a lot of tank space. Uh, you was talking earlier about crosses. Uh huh. We've got some crosses in this tank. 
And we've got Pseudotrophius right there, the striped fellow with the black fins on top. Oh, yeah, I see a couple of That's them. That's a Johanni, Pseudotrophius Johanni male crossed with a Pseudotrophius Edwardi. The fry are prettier than either one of the fish, I feel. Oh, really? Uh, you also mentioned that the genuses, we've had uh, Pseudotrophius zebra crossed with the Labrotrophius Bolborni. Oh, so there's... Uh, some There's relation in there that's very close. Either that or they're named wrong or it's natural. I don't know. Yeah. It's just what we found in our own home. Uh, there's a lot of crosses being trapped, so as it, you will, yeah. in a glass box. So if you're not careful in the aquarium, you can raise some fish that uh, are no longer right. now we've got the wild, huh? Right. We've got some in here that have color changes, like our Johanni fry. The gold they, one there? The goldfish, yes, they will... The males will turn blue in about another 30 days, yeah. and the females will stay gold. Just like these erratus, the old Pseudotrophius erratus, darkens up the males get right. a dark color. Mm -hmm. So you're going to end up with a lot of babies if you keep the cichlids and do your homework. No, so get this out of the here. way. And... There we go. Oh. Okay, we've got some in here that's quite rare. Oh. Uh, this is a... Well, the spotted one there is your Haplochromus living stone eye fry. You showed the adults earlier in the big tank. Now these are young from those ones in the tank, huh? Yes. Uh -huh. Now, this here, we've only had one spawn in three years, so all your rift lakes aren't that easy to spawn, we have found. Another fish up there is your Haplochromus morii. That's the oh. fellows here with the knot on their head or the knot just starting right in here. Yeah, there with the he is. stripes in there. Yeah. These are young. They will get eight to 10 inches long. As they get older, the knot will get bigger. More they, pronounced. Huh? Right, they will yeah. get bluer and lose a lot of that black what, marking. What's the model guy in there with them? The model one is a, uh, right here up front, we've got an Aristochromus species. Beautiful uh, fish. They are just starting to come in. I've seen three or four different color variations of them. It's real pretty fish. Aristochromus, huh? Mm-hmm. Beautiful. We've That's got a gold one. Yeah, now this, I was showing you the Johanni earlier there. This is the opposite color pattern. The male is gold oh, I see. and the so female that... is blue. This is a Pseudotrophius kenyai. This is the female. The one with, with the stripes there? The one with the stripes, the yeah. blue one with the stripes. The gold one is the male over here. Beautiful fish. Beautiful so. fish. Well, we're looking at fish here that are about uh, three inches long or so. Over in this tank here, we've got fish that are about seven or eight inches long. We were looking at it at the beginning, and there are some brilliant specimens in here. One thing that intrigued me, Jim showed up with this thing. Tell us about this thing, Jim. Okay, I was having trouble at home. I keep under gravel fillers in all my tanks. My friends keep bear tanks. I can't keep a fish alive with bear tanks. So I was getting a lot of debris on the bottom where it was catching underneath, you the know, rocks, the debris. Huh? Yeah. So I got tired of taking the rocks out and cleaning the tank, so I hung them on strings, like so. This is monofilament fishing line. A funny <laughs> thing happened. It totally confused the fish. Every time the fish came up to the rock, it would turn if it was touched. It's a new environment every time they swim by. Every time they come by to see their rock, it was it different. It was different. And so the spawnings dropped off, but I had a clean tank. And I suppose they're cut down to fighting too, huh? Yes, there they, they ought can't... to be some type of behavior study done yeah. on it because you can Sounds take like a real it. fussy, nervous fighting tank. I found I can hang the rocks in there. They are totally confused. They are subdued. <laughs> Don't know how to, what to do. Little uh, clue there for you from Jim White. He also says that his wife takes uh, garbage bag liners and cuts them up with the scissors and uh, simulates the plants, because the fish uh, do a job on the plants at times, and the uh, garbage bag liners work out pretty well as artificial plants. Right. Up here in the top tank, Paul, we've got some of the newer fish that's come in. This is a Lamprologus sex fasciatus, but they've changed the name. That's the striped one here, the, the bold striped one. Tretocephalus now. Tretocephalus, yeah. right. Nice bold markings. Beautiful. The other fish in the tank is the... Telmatochromus Jacob Freiberg eye. That's the one with the white fins. That's the male right there. A lot of color. Boy, that male is beautiful. No uh, question about it. Look at that. Oh, 
And he's got some youngsters in there with him, and there's a little young male in the center of the tank there that's just starting to color up. Oh, yeah. The female dorsal. Right. The females remain a dark brown. That's the female there, not much color. You can see the dull ones. Do they uh, eat this type of plant, or do they just no, use it they, as cover? No, uh, they just use it as cover. they got a lot of cover. Why They seem to quieten down a little Looks bit like and not fight. Fighting's a big thing. Keep yeah, your oh, yeah. tanks crowded. Yeah, some hiding place. It's like Nutella of some kind. But, uh, okay, what do we got down at the bottom here? Down at the bottom here, we got some frontosa. They don't want to come out too good. It's cyphotelapia, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. These are youngsters. They're about a year old now. Uh, they'll start spawning, hopefully, at a year and a half to two years. Well, here's the male. The male's got the big knot on his head there. Beautiful fish. Oh, yeah, look at that guy. Well, that fellow will get maybe eight to ten inches long. A lot more finnage. He's got a lot of finnage now, but the adults have a lot more finnage. Mm, flowing? Flowing yeah. fins, yeah. Beautiful. And uh, well, you don't see too many of those. They don't get very large spawns on those, Paul. Uh -huh. And uh, that's the reason there's not too many around. But you I, have spawned them. No, we haven't spawned those yet. Well, we want to <laughs> when I get older. Here, you use my towel. Thank you. Jim, I want to thank you for... Coming down here, and I want to thank you for bringing the fish. Okay, quite welcome. Well, it's been a real pleasure looking at the stuff that you worked with so hard to develop. And as you can see, if you do things right, you can certainly breed them. So you want to get into this phase of it. We've talked about them. We've looked at them. Don't uh, get the feeling that uh, we're looking at all of the African cichlids. This is really a drop in the bucket. Some of these are relatively inexpensive. Some of them are very expensive. But uh, tackle them. Breed your own. Maybe you can be one of the people to help bring the price down. As I said, cichlids, think cichlid. Feed them right. Keep that water clean. And have a little regard for their personal demands. In this case, either keep a few of them, you know, a male and three females, if you're going to try and spawn them, or too many of them by your standards. Otherwise, they kick the daylights out of each other. Very aggressive. So beautiful fish, well worth the effort. Well worth the price and a nice adventure in the hobby when you breed them.